Good morning, everyone. Jim Laird here from Largo, Florida. It is fall here, and it is it's beautiful. Um, it's funny. I was talking to uh, a friend of mine that uh, I grew up with in in Canada, and uh, he lives in the Edmonton, Alberta area. And he said it's like just about freezing now in the mornings. So it's uh, it's crazy the difference between. I mean, it's still, you know, in the 80s here in the morning, but the difference between uh, how fast things change in the north as opposed to down here in the south. So it's something I've gotten gotten used to. Um, it's it's crazy how you can adapt because, you know, for most of my life, you know, uh, we never even seen never never even seen 80, you know, 90 degrees when I was growing up. Uh, and now I pretty much live in that temperature and have adjusted quite well. It was interesting. You know, I don't, I don't talk sports very much. I, I do watch sports a little bit, uh, mainly because, you know, Dr. Stillman doesn't really talk sports, but <clears throat> it's been fun to watch uh, Deion Sanders with Colorado and what he's done to turn college football on his head. I've always liked Dion because he was always a very smart, smart player, very talented, obviously, but, the guys that are really, really incredible <clears throat> are the guys that are smart and talented. You know, there's a lot of talented people at the highest levels, but they don't put the time in. They don't understand the game. There's a lot of, you know, even when I played college football, there were some guys that were just absolute freak show athletes that uh, either didn't understand the game or didn't have the mental part of it. And Dion is, is obviously one of the greatest uh, athletes of all time. And his, his ability to now take that into coaching, uh, I think, is, uh, is pretty incredible. Uh, particularly, he's the kind of coach I would want to play for. Uh, straight up, no, no BS. You know, do your job. Values hard work. Values effort. Uh, is going to find a role for you as long as you show up and, and, and make an effort. He is going to very Bill Belichickish like, uh, but I think with a little better understanding of offense than, than Bill Belichick. But then again, so the topic today, <clears throat> kind of going off our normal health and wellness type stuff, but uh, muscle building tips for skinny guys. Let me add this caveat, and this this kind of goes into the health, wellness, and longevity thing. <laughs> um, I did a lot of things to my body to abuse the living daylights out of it <clears throat> for a long time, and I'm still here. I'm relatively healthy for my age. Um, thank you for liking the video, by the way. Um, whether you're trying to like impose your will on your body, whether it's gaining weight, losing weight, these are all stresses. So if you're naturally a really, 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 really skinny dude and you really, really force yourself to try and add muscle mass, that can cause a problem in time. But most people don't train hard enough to do that. Most people don't eat enough to do that. And most people don't go to the lengths I went to to add muscle mass, as in performance enhancing drugs. On that note, if you're on our email list, if you go to stillmanwellness.com, and you put in your email in the five biggest health mistakes, you'll get added to our email list Wednesday night. We do every week, we do a webinar this, this week. It's going to be on uh, our, it's part of our men's testosterone program. And uh, this one is going to be on HRT and peptides and all that stuff. We've saved it towards the end of the course uh, because we, we believe that, that the lifestyle part has to be there because there's a lot of people. We work with a lot of people in the practice that are on everything, but the kitchen sink. <clears throat> and, you know, even myself, when I did performance enhancing drugs, when I was younger, if you aren't taking care of yourself, you're not sleeping, you don't have the fundamental habits, you're going to crash and burn eventually. And so a lot of the people we work with are trying to basically overcome uh, a bad lifestyle with, HRT or whatever else they're using, right? And so if you get on the email list, Wednesday night you'll receive an email with the link to actually log into the StreamYard live webinar. Live webinar. It won't be broadcast. It won't be streamed on YouTube. 
we're just kind of doing this for for you being on our email list and a, and a thank you for that. So go to stillmanwellness.com, get on your email list. That way you get uh, every week. And then the week after that, I think we're doing, we're wrapping up our weight loss um, course that we're doing. So we're going to do an overview of, of weight loss and, and, you know, kind of summarize it for people. And, you know, cause you know, people are at totally different, like what you give somebody when they're first starting out um, for like, if they're trying to lose body fat, I shouldn't say weight loss, but that's kind of how it is. Like what I give somebody like myself to do to lose body fat is going to be totally different than someone who's brand new. Right. And then you've got to kind of experiment. And, but even with, even with pro bodybuilders, like, you know, I have a lot of friends that are pro bodybuilders. You know, most of my roommates are either former roommates were either powerlifters, bodybuilders, athletes. And even these guys who are doing all sorts of crazy stuff, they usually start, you know, a couple months before the show by cleaning the desserts out and, you know, cutting certain things out of the diet, cleaning things up. So they start simple and then they were, they progress into more complex things. And <clears throat> most people usually skip right to the complex things and they don't, they don't start subtly. They don't build habits. And then that's why most people get in trouble. Um, so on to the actual topic now. <clears throat> so when you're skinny, you're a smaller guy and you're trying to put on muscle mass now, super physiological amounts of muscle. I mean, there's this big thing right now about muscle mass and how important it is. And it's very important as you age. I think the most important thing as you age is yes, maintaining your muscle mass and building some, but the most important part of how you, when you age, and we'll talk about this on another topic as well is explosive power and balance, because I've seen lots of people that have lifted for years and years and years of these big blocks of, granite essentially that have horrible balance and can't move and that's just as bad as not having enough muscle at all because these guys are like you know having all sorts of orthopedic issues and they they you know the, the chances of them falling are a lot higher so you got to have a blended training if longevity is your answer but for people that are beginners <clears throat> what the problem that, that happens is is they look on youtube they look on instagram and they look at these guys that have been training for a long time and they hop into this high volume tr program that has all sorts of craziness. And even Dr. Stillman, when I first met him, I mean, he's put on like 20, 25 pounds since I first met him. Uh, if you go back and look at the old YouTube videos from a couple years ago and look now, it's like a night and day difference. And he was shocked at how little we started doing in the beginning. And people don't understand that when you first start, your body basically if you're just you haven't done anything, you start doing body weight stuff, you're going to put on muscle mass, especially if you up calories, right? If you've been under eating for a long time and all of a sudden you up your protein, you start eating a little more carbohydrates, particularly after you train, you're going to get a big response from that. The key is, is the body weight stuff and, and the lower level stuff needs to build the foundation for the next level of training. And most people never do that. Most people start off with some program they got off, off, off the internet. And I will recommend two basic fundamental programs <clears throat> for beginners. The two best programs are Jim Windler's five, three, one. And another program that's called West side for skinny bastards. Okay. And so when you're a beginner, you want to do two things. You want to build general relative strength with, for your own body weight one. And, and two, you want to also do more repetition type stuff like 10 to 12 repetitions. And, the nice thing about Jim's program is five, three, one. They have sets of five, they have sets of three. They do a single every couple of weeks. And you don't even have to do that. You could just do fives and threes. You don't even have to do the five, three, one. And with the Francos, you do like a max effort type thing, uh, like a West side thing. But it's like if you're not trying to compete in powerlifting, you do fives and threes. So for like, you, know, you would do like a couple sets of five on a, on a box squat or a safety bar squat or whatever. And then you would do your accessory work. You do your step ups, you do your your abs, your core work, you do some hamstring work, you could turn it into full body. It doesn't really matter, but there's, there's a combination of strength, getting stronger sets of five sets of three. There's no need to do any maximum stuff. You don't need to know a max. You just work up to a, a set of the five that's challenging that you can do with good form. And you do a couple sets there. Then you move on to your accessory work. And most people at first are going to do three to four sets of, you know, somewhere between 10 and 12. Uh, when you're trying to gain muscle mass, you need to control the eccentric a little more. You, you, the concentric, it should be a, a good pace. I mean, you could really slow it down and do like a slow eccentric 
slow uh, a slow eccentric a, a slow concentric but you're going to be sore as hell so a lot of people think you know they'll they'll start off new and then like i'm going to do like uh mike menser's program or they're going to do you know where it's like one set to failure well it's kind of hard to, to fire a, i think dave tate said this you can't fire a cannon out of a canoe right so you need you need muscle mass so in the beginning you want to be doing you know push-ups pull-ups you know things like that and i will caveat that you want to be able to manage your rib cage okay and one of the things that i do is take these programs and give people exercises that give them basically the position that stacked position where with zone of that position where the rib cage is in line with the pelvis and that's going to allow the shoulder blades the hips and everything i try to give people exercises that are great for the structure like dr stillman for example He's a narrow infrasternal angle, which means he's a tube. Okay, I'm more of a wide. I'm more of a like offensive lineman, fullback, straight ahead tractor. Dr. Stillman's more of like a, you know, rotation golf kind of thing. And he also has his, he also tends to pooch forward in his, in his belly. So he's got pressure pooching forward. So he has a hard time hinging. So he has a really hard time deadlifting. So we alter the deadlift for him. We use a trap bar, elevated trap bar for him. It's a much better position for him. So if he if he was to pull from the floor, I'm not saying he can't do it. It just it just would would not be a great long term exercise selection. So unless you're a power lifter, and and Doctor Stillman is not a great powerlifting body. Like I would never, you know, there are people that I've known that have forced themselves to to do sports that aren't really it'd be like me trying to be a rock climber like it's really you, you kind of gravitate to the sports you're naturally good at and i've always been good at lifting heavy things right and running really fast in a straight line that was always kind of my my mo right so people tend to gravitate towards the sport that their body is naturally good at you know we, it just only makes sense right but we can put muscle on dr stillman we can get him stronger using exercises that are going to like improve his biomechanics and one of the reasons he didn't really train consistently before is because he kept hurting his back because everything he was doing like deadlifts and the different exercises he was doing was really like he was using his back for everything so we were able to give him a different exercise selection so he actually is able to get his body in a good position where his body can work together as a unit as opposed to using like you know structure which would be like jamming into your spine and things like that to try and get your stability so exercise selection, for example, so, you know, Windler <clears throat> is going to recommend the barbell overhead press. Now, most people are not going to be able to control their rib cage. They're going to have to arch to do that, which is fine for, for some people that are a strong man or something like that. But for somebody who like plays tennis, who wants to put on muscle, I'm going to choose a landmine, which is where, you know, you can be in half kneeling or standing split stance. And the bar is here and it's in like the corner and the squat rack. And you've seen these things landmine and, and you press the bar like this. Right. And so, you know, we do that with a lot of volleyball players, baseball players, because they're it's a it's this, the pelvis and rib cage is stacked. It's much easier for them to get that pelvis and rib cage in a good position. So that shoulder blade can move and you can get a full range of motion. Right. So a lot of people will do like barbell, you know, overhead presses. So I would take something like that from five, three, one, I'd substitute it with some dumbbells. I'd substitute it with uh, landmine presses, something along those lines. Um, you know, even DeFranco's, uh, you know, West side for skinny bastards, it's a really old program, but I'm going to use, I'm going to select exercises from that program, like safety, safety squat bar squats, which is here. The, the yoke is here. Most people have a hard time controlling their pelvis and their rib cage when they're arched and pulling their shoulder blades together. So I can give them, unless they're a power lifter, they don't have to, you don't have to squat with a straight bar. You can do a front squat. You can do a box squat. You can do searcher squats. I mean, there's so many different variables that are going to help improve your biomechanics. And most of the traditional weightlifting exercises are great, but a lot of them basically drive this extended pattern right you know you're doing a lot of guys will do pull downs pulled pulled back and and they're pulling back really hard they never like they never get their rib cage down and they never really truly open up good bodybuilders will good bodybuilders will go through a full range of motion on rows on pull downs they'll do things at different angles but most people will aggressively pull their shoulder blades together and arch and that just leads to you know 
the shoulder not performing the way it's supposed to, the elbow not performing, it creates a lot of compression. And you basically, over time, you're really strong at the lifting weights, but when it comes to like everyday life and moving well, you kind of lose that ability. And for people at high level powerlifting, those kind of things, it's just kind of a trade off that you have to have. And there's ways that you can do, you know, Chad Wesley Smith, great powerlifter, uh, super strong guy, <clears throat> had a video of like, how do you like offset some of these, these adaptations? You do it by moving in different ways, particularly in your days off. So you can incorporate things that help you move well. So you don't become this like big stiff fire hydrant. Um, but you know, if you're trying to squat a thousand pounds, you're going to have to become a big stiff fire hydrant, right? You just have to do enough to make sure that that big stiff fire hydrant doesn't like destroy your back and your knees and everything else. But um, it's just like, you know, like you work with a world class sprinter, you're not going to be able to fix their interior pelvic tilt because they're pure, nor would you want to. The fact that they're extended and in an interior pelvic tilt is the reason why they can run as fast as they do. You cannot run at full speed without being extended and being in an interior pelvic tilt. <laughs> it's just like it's not going to happen. Right. So that's where all these nuances come in. But you just want to make sure that when you're a beginner, you don't drive this arched position so that it's your only option. Right. Because what will happen is, is people will start squatting. They throw their head back. They arch. They create stability by jamming into their spine. And then they do that on push ups. You know, they'll see it in the gym. You know, I'll, I'll go. I'll you know, I'll tell people when i work with people we actually saw some people in person i'll tell them to do a push-up and their their pelvis is dumped forward and they're kind of like humping the floor and i'll tell them to pull their pelvis under them they're like oh my gosh that's the first time i've felt my abs on on push-ups before getting them to move their shoulder blade all the way around and reach as opposed to just pulling your shoulder blades together and doing your push-ups like this where your shoulder blade isn't moving right so incorporating stuff like that a lot of beginners, they'll pull, you know, they'll pull those shoulder blades together. They'll arch really hard. Even when they're doing lunges, they'll, they'll be doing a lunge and they'll be arched. You know, they'll be doing this lunge with this arch in their back because it creates a great amount of stability. The problem is there's, there's consequences of always arching. You know, they'll be doing curls and they'll be arching. They'll be over press and they'll be arching and they'll be doing pull downs and they're arching. They're pressing and they're arching and they're deadlift and they're arching and they're squatting and they're arching. And then before you know it, you know, especially with women, um, they quit because like my back hurts all the time, you know? And so you want to make sure that you're doing things like goblet squats and you're doing things like rolling around on your back, hugging your knees. You want to do things that, um, you know, uh, presses where you're not aggressively pulling your shoulder blades together. You can go on my Instagram and I've got some examples of that, you know, where I'm doing the, the press and I'm not aggressively pulling my shoulder blades together. I'm actually, you know, having them move, I, I can't lift quite as much weight that way, but it, it, over time doing it in both ways is going to help you stay healthier and, and just move better in general. And also like th things like the bench press, if you want to bench press, that's totally fine. I'll just elevate my feet a little bit and put them on bumpers. So that I don't drive that overly drive that arch. Now, if you're trying to lift as much weight as possible, you're going to want to pull those shoulder blades together really hard. You're going to want to arch slightly because that's going to shorten the distance that you press the bar. And it's also going to create more stability to basically lift more weight. But the consequences of that over time is going to be compression and it's going to be loss of movement through the thorax. Which if you're trying to bench press five or six hundred pounds, great. But if you're trying to like live a normal, healthy life, not so much, you know, particularly if that's all you do and you can do things like you know, rounding over the stability ball, sitting in a deep squat, holding onto a post after your training session to help shut off this extended, this extended position, right? So that's basically, um, you know, how I help people, um, especially beginners, like backwards bear crawls, forwards bear crawls, sideways bear crawls with your pelvis tucked under you. All these things that, that you want to have some movement variability so that you don't get so locked into one strategy. And most beginners will hammer that extended pattern um, ridiculously, you know? So, uh, and then they, they quit because their elbows start hurting, their knees start hurting, their back starts hurting, and they're done. So you want to have that variability of movement. You want to be able to create the stack. Um, yeah, there's a couple of people that have, I think Zach Couples, you know, he refers to it as a stack. There's a number of people where you're stacking your pelvis and rib cage, circumferential expansion. You're not, you know, for years, like uh, the cue was to push into the front of your belt really hard. 
you actually want to, if you're wearing a belt, which, you know, for powerlifting is a great tool. I wouldn't wear it all the time. I would only wear it when you're lifting, you know, significantly heavy things. It just helps you create pressure so you can lift more. But if you're wearing, if pretend if you're wearing a belt, you want to brace all the way around. You want to line everything up. You're pulling your pelvis up. Take a breath in. You exhale. You blow the ribs down. You get your ribs in a good position. You take the breath. You take out the bar. And then you fill up and you create pressure all the way around your core, not just pushing it forward, right? And then you'll notice if you deadlift, if you notice that when you set your rib cage, you find your hamstrings, you go to down to the bottom to get set up for the deadlift, you'll notice if you take air into your low back, into your deep low back, the more air you can get down into your deep low back, the easier it is for you going to be able to get the bar off the floor, okay? And the thing that people the people don't understand is lifting heavy things requires like creating incredible amounts of force and requires incredible amount of stability. So there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that at all, if you're, especially if you're trying to lift heavy things. But you also have to do other things that allow you to flow, right? Or you're going to end up being this stiff, um, immovable object which doesn't move well, right? And over time that you might be okay with that when you're younger, but as you get older, like me, you know, I'm, I'm making sure I put a lot of variety in my training. So I don't make what I've done to myself for the last, oh gosh, since I was like 16 years old, um, any worse. Right. So I'm adding variety. I'm adding different types of things to my training. So I'm not driving this, this, uh, you know, making my thorax any stiffer than it is. I incorporate things where I'm, you know, pressing and reaching and rowing and reaching and, pulling down and alternating and things like that. And if most people just add some of that into their training, it's going to offset a lot of the adaptation that can cause problems for people. You just have to be able to shut that strategy off. So I'm happy to answer any questions if anybody has any, but, but that's why like general, like phys ed is so important and, and it's going to be even more difficult now because like when I was growing up, um, we did so many different sports and we moved in so many different ways. If we did really dumb things in the weight room, it was okay. Cause we did manual labor on farms. We did construction work. We had a general base of strength. So we, we had the ability to, to express things in different ways and our bodies were resilient enough to handle really dumb things. Um, but today, because most people don't have a mo movement base, kids particularly, they're going to, they're going to, they're going to basically, go to that stress strategy, that extended strategy much earlier than, than someone, you know, from my generation would, because they don't have a good movement base. Half the kids today have never climbed a tree. Half of them have never, you know, spent a whole day outside in the yard playing. Um, half the kids today have never been in a wrestling match or in a fist fight or, you know, like we used to spend when I was five, six, seven, eight years old, hours outside wrestling, like literally everybody, like in the yard and mud, you know, rough housing. We used to play Red Rover, Red Rover. They never called Jim Laird over because uh, I would never go for the arms. I'd go for the body. <laughs> so they never, I never got called over ever. Um, so, you know, we used to play games like that. And, and today that's just kind of like, you know, it's too violent. Don't do that. So it's a different world we live in. So the, the younger kids today that I work with, a lot of it in the beginning is rolling around on the floor, fair crawls. Um, you know, dragging sleds, pushing sleds, throwing medicine balls, athletic stuff, because, you know, carries a lot of this stuff kids have, have never, never done. And so they get thrown into these complex things and their body only knows one way to do it. And, and that's with the emergency strategy and the emergency strategy is great for, for short term benefit, but for long term, it's, you have to be able to do it in ways that, that basically don't limit your options so to speak thank you ben i appreciate that saying thank you uh does anybody have any questions i'd be happy to answer any questions it doesn't necessarily have to be on on meatheadness but west side for skinny bastards 531 two great beginner programs and then i would suggest um you can ask me the kind of exercises that i would modify but you want to make sure you're doing at least you know 60 70 percent of the time particularly on your accessory movements things that are going to emphasize the stack let's see james i have a i have a body frame like a tennis player i want to use weights because i have osteopenia how often per week should i train and how long for <clears throat> well a lot of that james is going to depend on your uh level of fitness 
And the, the big thing with osteopenia, you want to make sure you get enough sun. You want to make sure you, um, you know, are getting, you know, a good balance of nutrients in your diet. The sunlight has a big, a big um, component of that. We've talked about that with Dr. Stillman on our calcium video. If you're a tennis player and you want to uh, remain being able to move like a tennis player, then you're going to want to look at somebody like Eric Cressy and look at the kind of stuff he's doing with his um, with his baseball players. But you could do deadlifts, but you use something like a trap bar as opposed to a regular bar. It's a little easier to do that. So you could place some demand. Um, I would start with simple things like skipping rope for a couple minutes, you know, as part of your warm up. Don't overdo it. But that 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 basic you know, impact on the ground. That's the thing too, like playing tennis, you know, doing agility work, that is going to put demand on the bones. That's going to force the body to basically create or maintain bone mass and muscle mass. Like people like short sprints, you know, things like pickleball, things like tennis, those are really good for moving in different ways, shifting in different ways, creating that demand um, on the body so that you're going to keep your muscle mass. Um, you're going to want to do things like, you know, lunges in different ways, lunges with cross connects, um, any kind of pressing overhead would be like landmine type stuff. You want to make sure when you do pull downs, you want to make sure you're stacked, your rib cage, your pelvis are stacked so you can actually move your shoulder blades instead of arching. That's really going to help things like bear crawls. You just, you want to train, you want to still lift some weights, but you want to do it in a way that it's not very one dimensional and not very like power lifter like ish. But, you know, lots of different types of push-ups. I like offset push-ups. You know, you can start with pull-ups in a pull-up machine. I really like those pull-up machines where, um, you know, you can add weight to assist and you're, you're really focusing on stacking. You get you, you, the ones that you're on your knees or you're standing and you just really focus on keeping that rib cage and pelvis together and not arching while you're doing it. But just a general strength. Like I would say most people do really well on like a full body program twice a week. And then doing like the third day, some sort of like sled pushing or throwing medicine balls or um, anything like that. But two full body a week is kind of minimum. I like two full body a week or, you know, a, a leg day, upper day, and then kind of a full body beach day, I call it. That'd be really great. But I've seen people get results with one training session a week and then being active every day. So a lot of it has to do with what you have available to you, how much time you have, but it doesn't have to be like a bodybuilding program. You know, a really simple way to do it would be like a pair of deadlifts with like something like dumbbell floor press. I really like that because the dumbbell floor press, especially with the reach, lines the belly button and the pelvis up really nice when you're reaching and you're pressing. That's so that kind of gets your trunk ready to deadlift. And so you, you could do that in between your deadlifts. And then you would go to like, say you did lunges after that paired with pull downs. And then you did some, uh, some knee raises, you know, uh, either hanging from a bar or holding yourself up on a dip bar, knee raises with carries, you know, single arm carry. And, uh, you've covered, you've covered just about everything in that one workout. And then you would do the opposite, uh, in the next workout, you could do, uh, like an incline press, you know, paired with a row. And then you could, you know, you could do a goblet squat or step ups or something like that for your legs and basically do it like that. Whatever you didn't do in the first session, you do in the second session. And then I really like things like sled dragging, throwing medicine balls, doing some athletic stuff, um, things some going to be called skaters. But the length of the time is, is whatever time it takes for you to, to drive an adaptation. And generally, most people, if they're efficient, can get in and out of the gym 45 minutes to an hour. I like pairing things together and going at a moderate pace you want to, if you're trying to put on muscle mass you want to make sure that like your eighth about eight eight reps about at number eight by your third or fourth set you're like i don't know if i can make all 10 or 12 and it should be a little bit of a challenge but it's hard to really gauge on on um how often and how much you should train because i don't really know your fitness level i don't really know you know if you haven't trained in a long time you know, I've got these mini circuits. If you look up on YouTube, if you haven't trained in a long time and you just do that mini circuit three or four times through every day, you're going to see a huge improvement from that. And then you build on that and then you add something else. And sometimes, you know, you, you, you train a certain way and then you back off for a few weeks and do a little less. Sometimes you do a little more. It, it, it just depends on you, how your body responds. 
but the big thing would be getting outside more, uh, making sure you have a balanced diet and then making sure you're doing some things that, that, that place demand on the body to maintain your, your bone density and your, 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 uh, bone strength. Amy, how are you? I hope you're well. Uh, let's see here. How do you motivate uh, kids and teens to be more active? Well, one is to lead by example. So you want to lead by example. And uh, teens will go through these phases, you know, especially today because it's so easy to just sit in your sit in your room. And, and like when I was growing up, like they have one video. I knew we had Space Invaders. I think I was third or fourth grade when Space Invaders came out. And I remember playing it for like 10 minutes, 15 minutes. I'm like, this is really boring. Like, you know, okay, cool. There's a deer near, near. There's a little thing going side to side. And, you know, and, you know, even Contra, like, remember the up, down, BBA, whatever, you know, but you can only play that for like 30, 40 minutes. And then you just be like, ugh. And we would spend so much time outside when I was young. I would notice if I spent like time watching TV or playing video games, I ended up feeling like garbage. A lot of the kids today have grown up playing video games from a very young age. They've been in front of a screen. They don't really know the difference. They haven't spent as much time outside as kids in the past. I knew like if I watched too much cartoons or if I played too many video games, I would feel like garbage because I knew what it was like to be outside all day. So as a parent, you know, I, I don't have children, but I've mentored tons and tons of kids is basically just getting them to start where they are. And, you know, getting them at courage and at least to go outside, you know, leading, you know, go, you know, I'm going on a walk. You want to go with me, you know, kind of thing in the morning. And then once they start feeling better, you know, if they start complaining about, you know, maybe they don't like the way they look or they like the way they feel, then you can be like, you know, hey, um, there's this, you know, the sunlight really, you know, you can turn into more of a mentor than a, than a dictator. Uh, most people don't respond well to dictatorship. Um depends on the kid too and depends how old they are and depend on your parenting style but and you can always have you know them tune into you know tune in you know this guy's going to talk about light and how important it is and you know a lot of it is I, I would just basically encourage them and then lead by example ask them to go do things with you and then just hopefully they kind of take off on their own but when they're you know, when they're 10, 11, 12, you know, 14, 15, 16, a lot of times they're going to do what they're going to do. And there's not really Meredith Oak and I talked about this a lot. Um, you kind of have to decide what you want to be. Uh, for, for me, you know, if I had children, I'd be, you know, outside from, from the time they were born until all the way along, they'd be spending so much time outside that they wouldn't know any different. But um, if you haven't been able to do that, especially with our modern world, it makes it so easy to stay inside and be comfortable. Uh, but leading by example always works. And then, you know, you can always, particularly if they complain, then you can always bring someone else in to talk to them as well. Because that's one thing I've noticed about kids is parents would bring their kid to me and they'd be like, the kids finally listened. Like I've been telling them that for like four years. And a lot of times it's maybe not the, the delivery and the, and the kid doesn't take it seriously because it's from their parents. Because, you know, kids, people don't understand, like, especially men and boys, um, they go through that phase when they're, like, 12 to 16, where it's natural for them to, like, rebel and to, like, buck authority. And, and they kind of have to learn their pecking order, right? And so part of that teenage years is rebellion, uh, you know, on the, on the female side and the male side. And so a lot of them is they're going to balk their, their immediate authority and that's parents. Right. And so a lot of times having an outside influence who, who basically can talk to them and say, Hey, look, you know, if you want to feel better and you want to look better and, and you know, these are the things you can do, you can get outside more, you can eat these kind of foods, you can be more active. And once kids start getting more active, they start getting outside, they start basically feeling the difference. Right. And once they feel it, then they kind of buy into it for themselves. But it's, it's, it's not easy. That's for sure. Um, I, I, I have no idea like being a parent would, would be very frustrating to me. Um, you know, I, I don't have any firsthand experience on that, but, um, Amy, you just got to do the best you can. And, uh, you know, I know you're, you're trying to be more active and get outside more. So hopefully they see you doing that they see you eating better food and they start, you know, following your lead. So I hope that, I hope that answers your question. But I think too, 
putting kids in fun activities like things like ultimate frisbee things that are not as like competitive like more recreational type stuff even like even things like frisbee golf like people like look at it but you're walking long distances they're like oh this is really silly a lot of kids aren't naturally like driven into competitive sports so if you put them in things that even archery or i have a bunch of kids that that um i have a bunch of kids that just weren't into the team sports thing but they got into shooting and they got into archery and i had a couple kids go to college with archery and shooting you know at a high level that got them outside that got them you know doing some things in the outdoors and they just weren't into the team sports thing so a lot of times kids you know, we'll, we'll, they'll, they'll get in these highly competitive, like, you know, travel leagues and whatever else, like put them in a rec league, put them in something fun, send them to, you know, send them to church basketball, or hopefully you can find a youth group or something that does fun things outside or, or does group activities and, and just kind of steers them in the right example or the right direction. But, but I always revert back to kids are going to do what the parents, you know, basically lead them. And a lot of times, like I know when I was growing up, you know, my parents would say, Hey, clean your, clean your room. But I'd be like, well, the whole house is a mess. Like why you're telling me to clean my room, but the house in general is a disaster. So, you know, um, you know, you got to lead by example. Cause the, the kids will, if, if you're not doing the things you need to be doing to be active, the kids are, are definitely not gonna, if you're telling them to go outside and you don't, then, uh, and I, I don't think that's the case in your situation. I'm not, I'm not, uh, saying that you don't do that, but, uh, but generally kids will be like, Oh, mom and dad are telling me to eat better, but they're, they're pounding like four beers a night, you know? So it's like, okay, you know, kind of deal. David makes a good point. Scavenger hunts, geo coaching can be fun. Our dirt challenges. Yeah. Like going hiking. Like, Hey, let's go hiking today. Let's, let's go canoeing. Let's, Let's do, let's do something fun. Let's go to, you know, whatever outdoor activities in your area, uh, to kind of get them doing, so it doesn't have to be like sports, uh, specifically. So, uh, my kids have been from nature, barefoot as much for our hard find friends active to be with. Yeah. 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 I agree. If that's, you know, the, you know, that's the sad thing about today is like all this stuff, like in the sixties, seventies, eighties even the nineties, every kid on my block played outside. Like I go outside here and we, the, we have some young families here, but even when we're driving around, even here in Florida, you don't see kids outside at all, you know, cause it's so much easier for them to have connection on their Xbox. You know, the, it's one thing to play space invaders where you're playing the computer. It's another thing when you're playing like one of these like high level games where you've got like, all your friends are on there via Wi-Fi, and then you're texting. You know, all the friends are texting. You know, I've gone out to dinner, and I've seen like kids at a table, like six or eight kids sitting there at a table, all texting each other. <laughs> so, it, it, it our society, it, it's it's really sad, and and that's one of the reasons why you know Dr. Stillman and I are are uh, really interested in you know building community and introducing like-minded people to each other and is that in the next several years people are going to have to make a choice between this kind of virtual reality world that we're being pushed into very aggressively and then living a more like realistic world where you're spending more time outside in nature and you're connecting with people personally and you're you know because we're creating this world the world they want for us is this metaverse where you basically have these 3d goggles on you have a virtual reality girlfriend or boyfriend or whatever friend you want to call it um and you're playing like you know madden and all these different sports on a computer you're not actually doing them in person um, that's the world they're trying to create for us and i really don't i like i'll flirt with that world but i, I sure as hell ain't gonna marry it so as parents, as, as leaders, as communities, we're going to have the people that are like-minded and don't want to be a slave to that kind of system. And they see the dangers of it are going to have to band together and create communities where the kids, you know, do go outside and play. And that's why I love central South America. Cause you see kids playing in the streets all the time. You know, they, they're out playing in the streets. They're out doing stuff. You see kids riding around on dirt bikes. You see, you know, <laughs> Like you see kids being kids and you, you don't see that in our culture today. And it's, it's really sad. 
So, well, everyone, thank you for commenting. Thanks for the feedback. We appreciate it. Like I said, get on our email list so you get our uh, get in on our webinar on on hormone replacement on HRT, and you'll get both of our opinions on that, uh, how people go wrong uh, with it, how people can do it more efficiently if it's even needed at all. These are all questions that we're gonna go over, and I'll, of course, I'll give my uh, my firsthand account because I've been on the performance side of it and also the health side of it, and I can tell you about the differences between the two. Um. And I'm sure Dr. Stillman and I'll have some controversial opinions that, uh, that will ruffle some feathers. So, but the cool thing is it's all behind a, behind a paywall or private. So, you know, don't have to worry about getting shut down off the internet and all that good stuff, but have yourself a great day. Please get outside. You deserve it. And, uh, thanks for tuning in.